Co-Star News and Businessimo are at MIPIM 2023 and we are joined on the set of BITV for a special interview uh, with Mr. Christopher Merlitz, Managing Director and Head of European Investments at WP Carry. Christopher Merlitz, thank you for joining us on the set of BETV. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And nice to see you, Bert Eric, as well. <laughs> uh, although macroeconomic tensions uh, were felt everywhere uh, over the last year, uh, not all regions were affected in, in the same way, uh, shall we say. Um, how has the North American and APAC regions maybe uh, uh, gone through uh, this uh, tumultuous time compared to uh, the European real estate market? Sure, interesting question. And uh, I would agree with you that what we've seen last year, the reversion back to a, what should be probably described as a more normal interest environment um, is a global phenomenon. And the, do, do, the two areas that we cover, WB Carry, tend to be North America and Europe as a whole. And so that's probably where the area of expertise lies, less uh, on, the, on the Asia Pacific front. Um, but looking at those two markets and contrasting certainly the North American market with Europe, I would say that the speed of adjustment in North America seems to be substantially faster. Mm. So when you look at the impact and change in pricing, change in pricing of commercial real estate relative to the changes in cost of capital, it tends to be a quicker adjustment in North America. So Europe does still lag behind. Mm. and. That is not necessarily a good thing. I would say it is not a good thing because it means it's going to take us longer to go through this transitionary phase to reach a new level of interest rates where you really have, let's say, an active market. Because whenever you have quite a big gap between sellers and buyers' expectations, it leads to a stalemate, essentially. Mm. And you want to have those expectations narrowed down to a certain degree where you have a more normal transaction environment again. And so US is ahead, call it six months, call it nine months, whereas in Europe that still will take a bit more time and probably into the second half and well into the second half of this year before I'd say somewhat more normal activity resumes. At least that's my expectation at this point in time. Mm. So what does it mean for your business? Are you, for example, more active in the US now because the repricing is further ahead than in Europe and taking a bit of a backseat on, on Europe? I'd say to the degree that is true. However, the product and the type of transaction that we close, the sale and leaseback, is something that's incredibly portable as a business product, as a form of financing for companies. And so rather than saying that we're doing less in Europe, it actually tends to be the type of seller groups that are somewhat more driving the volume that we're seeing actively market and that we're actively pursuing right now. And that's a long and convoluted way of saying that it tends to be that the larger share of the active sellers that we are currently interacting with tend to be US sellers who own real estate in Europe who've realized, okay, this sh shift in interest rates is not something that's got to be over in a couple of months. This seems to be a more structural change. We accept that pricing has changed. We still want to transact. Whereas maybe purely Europe domiciled sellers, they s tend to be slightly more on the sidelines. Um, so I'd say I, I, I would characterize it a little bit more than that. So we're not really sitting by the sidelines. We're very active. We want to do more. We are keen to invest. We have uh, a lot of dry powder, a lot of liquidity that we can, we can deploy. But it tends to be the types of sellers that are actually willing to transact. That seems to be the main differentiator right now. How, how do you price in uh, rising interest rates and where do you see it stopping? If, if I knew the answer, I should not be sitting here. I, would, I should be somewhere else. But um, I would say we do price it in. And, and the, the nice thing and one of the beautiful things about being a REIT and being perpetual capital and being basically an all equity purchaser, the way we look at the world, we look at, it at our cost relative or yields relative to our cost of capital. And that's something we can quite easily determine in, in whatever environment we're in. It, we, we just got to ask ourselves the question, looking at where our cost of capital stands today, is this deal good? Are we getting a sufficient spread? And being a REIT investor is basically, it's a spread based business. You want to generate a return on your capital well in excess of your cost of the capital. So we do price it in, we, we are realistic about it, and how high will interest rates go, how much longer will we see an increase. I would say that we are already seeing a slowdown on, of the increase in rates, 
and you can probably expect some plateauing at the second half this year. There are already some underlying concerns in the economy and I think everyone saw in the news uh, the demise of SVB in, in the US that maybe some kind of an early canary in the coal mine as to how much rates can go higher before you really see see bigger issues popping up in the economy. So how high exactly they will go nobody knows. Will they go higher? I think they will go higher. For how long will they go higher? I would say at least for this year and maybe even into the next year as well but at smaller increments. So mm. I think the the the, the, the rate of increase is declining. That's what I would look at it. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned your uh, willingness uh, uh, to invest in uh, European real estate. Uh, in the past, you were uh, quite eager about the sell and leaseback uh, subsector, yeah. uh, sell and leaseback strategy. Sorry, um, how attractive is this sell and leaseback approach uh, now in this what some call the new cycle uh, in real estate? Hugely, because when you look at the typical companies that we work with, their cost of capital has changed, sort of call it the single B, the double B credits, their cost of capital has changed substantially more in, 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 in markets relative to the pricing that you would see on a sale and leaseback. So on the relative basis, the type of capital that we can provide corporates is, is much more attractive. And you combine that with us being an all equity buyer we don't need any kind of bank financing and we can move very fast also in very large transactions and you combine that with a 50-year track record in structuring these transactions which is unrivaled anywhere in the world it, it, it makes actually for a really compelling story right now for companies to revisit their real estate portfolios and to consider a sale and lease back as a very very attractive form of financing certainly relative to to anything else you see out there right now But that must be tricky for you as well to find out whether these companies will be able to survive if they need money that desperate that they're going to sell the silverware. That's a that's a very very good question, and we we are very careful to assess why does a company transact in uh, or why do they want to engage in a sale and leaseback? And desperation is a very very good sign why that should not be a sensible counterparty for us. We are a perpetual long-term holder. There is nothing in it for us to structure a deal with a company and structure a 20-year lease, a 25-year lease, and that company disappears in 24 months or in 12 months. That's bad business. When we go into a transaction, we want to make sure a company does it for the right reason uh, and for the right reasons, not only for the sake of the company, but also we would expect to own that real estate for decades to come and we want to have a tenant in the buildings that we acquire. So there's a mutual benefit here to make sure that A, we are comfortable with the counterparty of the credit and B, obviously the, the counterparties you deal with are comfortable with the, with the transaction. And that's a big part of our expertise is making sure we understand the companies that we work with and they put the proceeds to good use, to pay down debt or maybe to expand some business initiative, to maybe acquire a competitor, to, for, for those to be positive directional changes that a company can take rather than something that is, as you said, you know, selling the silverware in desperation. That would be a very, very clear st reason for us to say sorry, but that's not the right counterparty. That's not a very sensible long-term reason to transact. And we, we, we do take great care and actually pride in making sure we understand the rationale of these transactions. Thank you very much, Christopher Merlitz. Th thank you, Bert Eric, as well. Sadly, that's all the time uh, we have today. Uh, thank you all also for joining us. We'll see you soon on, uh, uh, in Cannes, sorry, at MIPIM 2023.